Uh, I want to begin by uh, expressing appreciation for your um, interest in this subject. Um, quite frankly, we've been pretty amazed at the response across the health system and the interest in what's happening with the Affordable Care Act. A and I must tell you that I'm grateful generally for people who um, want to be informed about this law because one of the difficulties with the law is that there is a huge amount of misinformation and misunderstanding about this law. So your attendance indicates that you want to be informed. So what I want to do is jump right in and our game plan for today is as follows. Uh, first of all, we're going to um, ask the question, why reform now? Uh, then we are going to spend some time looking at what the law intends to do. Obviously, there's not time to go through the several thousand pages of this law and to go into detail of the content of the law, but I do think it's important to uh, at least have some understanding of what the law attempts to do. And then third, I'm going to give you an update on sort of what's happened in the meantime, uh, responding to the question, where are we now? And then uh, I'm going to end the uh, time by uh, answering some questions that I have put forth, along with some help, uh, about how it affects people perhaps in this room. Uh, and then uh, if we don't answer your question by the questions I pose, uh, then we'll obviously take some time uh, and I'll be glad to stay afterwards to respond. Um, Camille is here from em Employee Benefits and she has a lot of understanding of the law and especially as it relates to affecting the employee health plan at Baptist and, and that's the reason she's followed me around and likely is very bored with uh, hearing this over and over again. Let's talk about why health care reform now uh, and I'm going to be brief but I think it's always important for people to understand this did not happen in a vacuum. There are a number of factors that have increasingly driven the recent push for health care reform in this country and you know you wouldn't be surprised by the list but the two most significant reasons why health care reform really began to get momentum in this country had to do on the one hand with the ever spiraling cost of health care and on the other hand with the um, increasing number of uninsured or the lack of access to the health care system. Both of these graphs you see basically uh, outline that. The first shows that despite whatever's been done and the first, in this case, being on the far side, shows health expenditures in this country as a percentage of the gross domestic product. And so when you hear the President and others talk about the Affordable Care Act bending the curve, this is the curve they're talking about, trying to flatten that line of ever-increasing expenditures and even perhaps bending it down. And the other is uh, the number of uninsured, that number now approaching 50 million people. Uh, and I would submit to you, as I have to others, that um, it is a travesty in the most sophisticated democracy on the face of the earth that nearly 50 million Americans do not have access to the health insurance system as you and I know it. And we see them in the form of the uninsured who come to our emergency rooms on a daily basis. It's a good point to also stop and point out the fact that our health care system does not compare always favorably to what takes place in the rest of the world. And so if you looked at health care expenditures compared to other industrialized nations, here's the graph. The red number is the number in America. And you see all the other industrialized nations that we consider akin to us and how much they spend on health care per capita. It's a pretty dramatic difference, isn't it? And you would think then, because we spend that amount of money compared to others, that the outcomes are that much better. But in reality, that's not the case. And so the next slide kind of shows you just one. This is life expectancy in our country with the United States in blue, obviously below every other one of the industrialized countries. And it really doesn't matter whether you're talking about maternal deaths at childbirth or whether you're talking about life expectancy. Pick your metric. We don't compare really well despite the fact we spend far more money on health care than any other industrialized nation. So with that reality, and put in a nutshell, the reason health care reform began to get momentum in America really is that health care costs are viewed as unsustainable, quality to some degree is uneven and inconsistent, and access to health care is inadequate and getting worse. 
And so I mean, my point about that, it's really not that big a surprise that health care reform really passed in 2010. Most experts agree that the health care system as we know it is not sustainable long term. Another way of saying this is to simply insist on the status quo is truly likely not a long term viable option for us in this country. And I happen to be one who believes that. Uh, we can't do this the way we've been doing it or it won't be affordable for this nation. So with that, the Affordable Care Act passed. And again, without going into details about this law, uh, I want to just talk about in three kind of buckets what the law intends to do. I would submit to you that virtually every one of the items in the law falls into one of these three broad buckets that parallel with the intent of the law. Obviously, there is no way to avoid oversimplifying what is a very complex health care piece of legislation. Uh, but basically what the law attempts to do, on the one hand, is to expand coverage. Number two is to control cost. And then number three is to actually transform the delivery system itself. And again, I would suggest that essentially this law and every element of it falls into one of these three buckets. It's always important that I say that we're talking about these separately, but every one of these really overlap. So it's sort of an artificial partitioning for the sake of clarification or discussion. Uh, but, you know, it, it really is, uh, again, sort of pulling things apart that actually uh, very much interact with one another. Let me just say at the outset that this is the most significant and complex piece of health care legislation in this country since the passage of Medicare and Medicaid in 1965. Nothing comes close. And I would also say to you, there are very few bills passed by the United States Congress that are anywhere near the complexity and scope of this legislation, even outside of health care. Just another way of saying, this is a big deal. This is a big bill. And so it is worth pausing to say, what is it it attempts to do? So let's talk about coverage reform. As I said, one of the reasons for this law is to address this issue of nearly 50 million uninsured in our country. And the way I like to look at this, and it really helps as you try to understand the law, is to reflect on who the uninsured are. There's sort of a misunderstanding that the uninsured is this homogeneous block of very poor people who don't work. In fact, that just is not true. In fact, I would tell you that in the city of Jackson, we know as a fact that nearly 75% of the people without health insurance in our own community work full time. The very poor really are covered by Medicaid. And so if you look at who are the uninsured, we look at the white gap there. They are the, what we call the working poor, those people who are employed but don't have access to employer provided health insurance. They are the poor but not poor enough to qualify for Medicaid from the government. They are those who refuse to buy insurance, even though they can afford to do so. And by the way, there are those who estimate that's well over 20 to 25 percent of the uninsured are people that simply choose not to buy it, primarily people between the ages of 21 and 35 who just fundamentally believe they're not going to get sick. Unfortunately, when they're in an accident or do get sick, guess who pays for their health care? We do. There are small businesses uh, that do not offer health insurance. And then you get down to the bottom, there are individuals with pre-existing conditions who his, heretofore have not been able to obtain health insurance or have been dropped from health insurance coverage. So really they are the people who fall in this crack between these two green boxes. Because most health insurance in this country is obtained on the one hand through the employer or through the government via Medicare, Medicaid, Champus, and one of those programs. Most of you know that historically it's been very difficult for individuals to buy health insurance in any kind of affordable way. So you either get it through your employer or you get it from the government. And yet there's this whole block of people, 40 some million, who actually fall in the gap. So what the law attempts to do, very simply, is to move people out of the white gap into a green box of coverage. And so that means there's not just one thing that one can do to accomplish that task. And that gets us into what the law does. And so here's the four basic categories that I would suggest 
are really attempting to do just this. It begins with the individual mandate. In the law, technically, this is known as the personal responsibility requirement. It is the requirement that all United States citizens and legal residents with certain hardship exemptions will have to demonstrate that they have health insurance when they file their income tax next April. This is a mandate of the federal government that you have to have insurance if you're a United States citizen or legal resident or you will pay a penalty when you file your income tax next April. This is the provision that was quite controversial that was reviewed by the Supreme Court and I'll come back to talk about that in just a moment. In addition to the individual mandate, there are employer requirements. There is not an employer mandate per se. This law does not make all employers have to offer insurance. But there are employer requirements. Employers with more than 50 employees must offer what's described as adequate and affordable coverage or they will pay a fee. That's 50 and above. 25 and below, there are actually incentives to small businesses in the form of tax credits to actually offer insurance. So this law ventures into the employer world with the intent of trying to get employers to do a better job of offering health insurance who do not currently do it. And most of you know, you've read in the media, that this particular provision was delayed from January of 2014 until 2015, and that had a certain controversy about it. And that just happened in the last couple of months. The third thing it does is expand Medicaid and offer certain subsidies for the poor. What the law seeks to do is to expand Medicaid from 100% of the federal poverty level to 133% of the poverty level, and then offer certain premium tax credits and other cost uh, sharing subsidies for those who fall between 133% of the poverty level and 400% of the poverty level. And just to give you a sense, 400% of the poverty level for a family of four is $94,000 a year. So that's a pretty broad group of people that will get subsidies when they go to the exchanges or, or buy insurance uh, going forward. Uh, and we're going to say more about Medicaid expansion in a moment in the update section as well. And then the fourth bucket under expanding coverage is a whole range of things around insurance reform. And if you really want to go to sleep, this is the section that you should read of this law. It is very technical, uh, and it is many, many pages of this law. And many things occur in this insurance section, the first of which is the creation of state-based health insurance exchanges. And many of you have heard much about these exchanges that now the administration is calling the new health care marketplace. Um, Basically, it's for people, individuals, to go to this exchange, this new marketplace, and buy insurance who don't otherwise have it provided by their employer. In addition to the individual exchanges, and some people don't realize this, the law creates small business exchanges that are actually called SHOP, a separate set of exchanges where small business owners can go and buy insurance through the web, through these exchanges, uh, for their employees, again, in businesses that don't currently offer insurance. And then it does a number of other things. It does what we call guaranteed issuance and renewal. By law, with the Affordable Care Act, anyone with a pre-existing condition cannot be denied coverage, nor can they be dropped from coverage. And that's what we mean by guaranteed issuance and renewal. It also requires employers and others who offer insurance, including Baptist Health, to offer coverage to adult children up to 26 years of age. It's real important. I used to say this means it's covering dependents up to 26, but they don't have to be a dependent, and I'll come back to that in a minute. They just have to be a child. They can be a married child, but the law requires us to cover them, and we are now doing that in our own plan, as is the case with other insurance plans. It does other things that I won't go into the detail about eliminating annual lifetime limits, waiting periods. So there's a huge section of this law that addresses insurance. So here's the point about that. If we go back to the prior slide, those things I just outlined collectively, although they're distinct, collectively begin to move people out of this white space into 
a box of coverage. And I'll give some examples. I mean, small businesses, for example, now have this new option of small business exchange. And they also have incentives to offer health insurance. Individuals can no longer refuse to buy insurance. They're required by law to do so through the individual mandate. Individuals with pre-existing conditions can no longer be denied. They have to be covered because of the guaranteed issuance and renewal. So you go through, and those things I just described, begins to move people out of the white space into coverage. And the original estimates are that this law will move about 32 million of the uninsured into being insured. Now those who are really math wizards in the room will say, well, didn't you say that there were 48 million uninsured? And this law only will move 32 of them? Well, the reality is there are still people who will fall between the cracks. And in case you missed it, I said this law really affects United States citizens and legal residents. And a large number of the uninsured in our country are not legal residents. And so in places like South Florida and South Texas, this law has no applicability to that population, and so they remain uninsured because they were not able to be covered by this law in the political halls of Congress, and so that's why you still have a gap of uninsured. But still, moving 32 million into, you know, out of 48 is still huge progress, and, uh, and I would suggest it's a good thing for those of us in healthcare. But it's not inexpensive. Everything that I've described up to this point cost money. In fact, you may be interested in knowing the General Accounting Office of the federal government says over the next 10 years, what I just described, all those things, is going to cost about $946 billion. The first estimate of what it was going to cost was $1.1 trillion, and the administration didn't like the idea of it costing a trillion, so they went back and got the number under a trillion. I go ahead and throw the trillion up there. I mean, a billion here, a billion there. I mean, I, I'm so beyond my knowledge. So the reason I've redone the slide I showed you a minute ago about health care expenditure, remember we said the law is trying to flatten the curve? Well, the problem is we just added a trillion dollars over the 10 years to the curve. So we've got to figure out how we pay for that trillion before we even get to the task of flattening the curve otherwise, although to some degree those costs are embedded in the system anyway. But uh, the law does very specific things to cover the 946 million. A number of pages in this law does that. And it's really a combination of fees and taxes that actually help pay for the 946 billion dollars. There are taxes on pharmaceutical companies, taxes on medical device companies, taxes on insurance companies, and there are taxes on higher income Americans, over $250,000 family income, uh, to help pay for the 946 billion. And then the hospital industry, you may find it surprising, and since we're talking to hospital people, actually stepped forward and said, I tell you what, we will take a huge cut to Medicare reimbursement to help fund that expansion. And some of you are saying, well, why did y'all do that? Well, clearly, if 20% of the people who come to our emergency room have no insurance, we don't collect anything, and half of them are not going to have coverage, we're going to get this great boost of revenue. And what we agreed with the government is, since we're going to get this new revenue coming through the door, we will reduce payment from Medicare to sort of help balance this out a little bit and pay for the expanded coverage. That's fine as long as Medicaid expansion occurs. And as you know, in our own state, it's not occurring. We'll get the cuts, but we're not going to get the revenue. And that's a point I'll come back to in just a minute. But now we've talked about how we're going to pay for the $946 billion over the next 10 years. We need to also talk about how it is that we do the long-term bending the curve, how we stop that ever-escalating expenditure that you saw on the two graphs that I've showed you up to, to now. And the law does a lot of things. I mean, it, for example, gives significant incentive money around electronic medical records. Most of you know uh, we've been working to obtain that money and have successfully done much of that at Baptist. The idea being that ultimately moving the system from a paper-based system to an electronic system will ultimately be more efficient and save money. Number two, it does a lot in terms of health promotion and encouraging health promotion. Even in the Medicare system, this law actually uh, pays for certain things with no deductible that currently Medicare 
uh, actually has a copay or, or is subject to the deductible. So the idea being, we, let's keep the population healthier and that will save money. And then the third thing, there's a fairly significant investment in primary care. The idea being to get people into a primary care office and away from the more expensive setting of the emergency room to produce continuity of care. Now I would say those kind of things, and there are more, these are sort of examples, those things are really good things, but they have a little bit of a long-term runway to actually, actually save costs. They don't happen like that. And so the real question is, can we wait for those things to take effect? And then that's where the third bucket, remember the third bucket? About changing the delivery system? Basically, it's the third bucket that probably has the greatest impact on ultimate long-term savings. And so let's move to that bucket when we talk about changing the delivery system itself. This slide is the preamble to the Senate Finance Committee document in 2009 before the law was passed. And what it basically says is that the health care reform law seeks to move this system from a fee-for-service payment system to a system that rather rewards on the basis of value. Most of you know that we talk about this, that we're moving the system from volume to value. That's become a phrase that we're all using. And in fact, if we're honest, right now, all of us, be you physicians in the room, be us hospital, we are rewarded based on volume. Every time we do something, we get paid. When we do something else, we get paid again. And if we don't do anything, we don't get paid, right? So it is a fee-for-service, volume-driven system. And so one of the least understood parts of this law is the efforts to try to change that payment system to re-incentivize the healthcare delivery system to do things differently. Now, since most of you are in healthcare, it's important to understand what it does in this bucket of changing delivery are primarily in a pilot or demonstration phase at this point. It is not mandatory changes, uh, but nonetheless, it begins to give us an indication of where the delivery system and particularly the payment system is going to go long term, and it's a very important part of the Affordable Care Act. And again, I have a lot of one, twos, and threes. There are three basic categories of changes that are going to occur in this delivery system. The first is what I throw generally into the area of pay for performance. Basically what this does is begin to link reimbursement with quality and patient satisfaction outcomes. Actually, that's already begun. Any of you who are familiar with what we're doing in patient satisfaction and quality in the hospital, you know that already we are being penalized if we don't compare well on certain quality metrics or we are rewarded if we compare well. So things like hospital acquired infection rates, if we fall in the bottom quartile comparatively with other hospitals, we get penalized. If we fall in the good part of the quartile, we actually get bonus. So it begins to link reimbursement with outcome. I would argue that that's not an illogical thing to do. It begins to move the bar of quality and, and even patient satisfaction to another level. And that's proven to be the case. The second category is simply what we've referred to various kind of bundle payment arrangements. These really are still in a pilot phase. They are being experimented with across the country, and there are a number of them, by the way. The Brooks Rehab System here is doing a pilot bundle payment arrangement regarding, uh, you know, joints and joint replacements. And so various systems have applied for bundle payment arrangements. We at Baptist have not done that. Uh, what is a bundle payment? Well, they come in various forms, but the one that's easiest to explain is what I call an episodic bundle payment concept. And the easiest way to talk about this is the most common reason that someone is readmitted to a hospital in the Baptist system, not atypical of systems across the country, is for congestive heart failure. That causes more people to be readmitted to a hospital. So what happens if a patient with congestive heart failure is admitted to the hospital, is discharged, and they're readmitted five days later. We all get paid again. If they go home and then are readmitted a third time, 10 days later, what happens? We get paid a third time. What the bundle payment, episodic bundle payment seeks to do is to take one big bundle payment out of which everybody will be paid, let's say for congestive heart failure, and we pay everybody out of the bundle and then 
if the patient is readmitted within a 30-day period, nobody gets paid again. It's an attempt to re-incentivize the system to basically say, we want you to be rewarded for avoiding readmissions. And therefore, it's your disadvantage if you don't do things that help people stay out of the very expensive hospital setting. Sometimes I refer to this as DRGs on steroids. It basically takes that DRG payment and expands it over a 30-day period. Again, this is in pilot mode. It's not become the way we're going to be paid. But at least gives you some sense of the kind of arrangements that are being contemplated going forward to re-incentivize us to keep people healthy. And one of the reasons, for example, readmissions is a key issue. It accounts for billions of dollars of cost in our system. Uh, and we know that uh, through the years, readmissions to hospitals. The third category is probably the most extreme example of new payment arrangements, and we refer to those as ACOs. You've heard a lot about that, accountable care organizations. And the most extreme example of an ACO is when a health system such as ours would get paid a certain amount per person per year and say, this is what you get paid to take care of this person. You don't get any more no matter what you do. It, you, it's a capitation kind of payment. And again, there are systems that are moving toward that kind of arrangement uh, on a pilot basis. Not a lot, uh, and there are some other versions that are a little bit uh, less dramatic than that particular description. But all of these kinds of things and this changing delivery are really encouraged by this law to experiment. Can we do this different? Can we change the way that we're paid and therefore ultimately uh, reduce health expenditures in this country over the long run. And time will tell whether that's the case. But again, it's important to understand that's a key component of the law that, again, doesn't get a lot of attention in the public media because it primarily affects providers uh, and not uh, the actual patient, at least obviously at the beginning. So again, if we return to the three things the law seeks to do, it seeks to expand coverage, control cost, and very closely related to that is to change the health care delivery system itself and specifically the payment system. That's the law in a nutshell. Let me just stop there to say, have you noticed that there might be some things that are missing in this law? Did anybody note that malpractice reform has not been mentioned? That's because malpractice reform did not make it into the law. There was a lot of effort to get tort reform into the law, and one would argue if you're going to do a comprehensive reform of the American health care system, that might be something one would have addressed, but it didn't make it because politically it couldn't get through. So there are, I would argue, several things, that being one of the most notable, that did not become a part of this reform law. So with that general, oversimplified, broad sweep of the law, let's come back to look at, so where are we now? Let's kind of do a current update with this law, and there are about six things I want to say about that. Number one, and it's the most obvious, but it's important to underscore this, and that is that the Affordable Care Act is the law of the land. And the only reason I say that, there are people in this country who still believe this law is going to go away. And with some hesitation, I have to say to you, I do not believe there's any way in the foreseeable future that this law is going to go away. If you believe the President of the United States is going to let this law be repealed and not lead to it, I think you're living, quite frankly, with an illusion. And first of all, the United States Senate is not going to let that happen. And despite the fact that the House of Representatives has voted to repeal it now 40-some times, it's not likely to happen. And so I think we need to understand in the update, this law is the law and it is being implemented. And despite the current rhetoric in Washington around, you know, essentially trying to tie the um, debt ceiling and everything else to the repeal of the Affordable Care Act, that clearly is not going to happen in most voices, even, even some voices on the party that would love to see that happen or really saying this is probably not a, an achievable goal, and I, I personally don't think it is. One of the confusions, though, about the law is that a recent Kaiser tracking poll says that four of ten Americans are unaware that this law exists. You're in health care. It's hard to understand how this could happen, but you've got to remember this is a very complicated thing that the average public, and I think that's a little bit of a commentary on the poor job that the administration has done in communicating this law. And furthermore, of those people who know it exists, 49% say they really do not understand how it impacts them. So it's the law of the land, but there's still tremendous lack of information and understanding about the law. 
Second update has to do with the rulings of the Supreme Court of the United States, and there were two significant rulings that I think it's always helpful to explain to people. One was that they ruled, for reasons that were somewhat surprising, that the individual mandate requiring people to buy health insurance is constitutional. The real question was, can the federal government require individual citizens to purchase any service? Is that constitutional? We knew that the state could do it. That mandate existed in Massachusetts under Governor Romney, interestingly enough, a Republican governor. And as a result of Romney care, 98.5% of Massachusetts citizens now have health coverage. But whether the federal government could impose that was really the constitutional question. And because they decided this was really a matter of taxation rather than a violation of inter interstate commerce, the Supreme Court ruled, you remember, on a five to four decision that this is constitutional. If that had been ruled unconstitutional, this law would have kind of come, un come unraveled because it's such an important pillar of the law. But the other decision made by the Supreme Court that was quite frankly surprising, and most of us had no really belief that this would occur, the court said the federal government cannot make the states expand Medicaid eligibility. Medicaid expansion is optional to the states. Very interesting ruling. And so the result of that, as the slide will show, is that well over 25, I think it's about 26, of the states in the United States have said we're not going to do it. All the states in blue on this map are not expanding Medicaid, including our own state of Florida. Just to give you again an, ex an understanding of what that means to the state of Florida, because our state legislature has chosen not to expand Medicaid, we are turning down $50 billion of federal money over the next 10 years and leaving 1.1 million Floridians uninsured. Those numbers bear repeating. We are turning away $50 billion of federal money and leaving 1.1 million Floridians uninsured. And remember I told you that we agreed to take some Medicare cuts because we were going to get this new revenue with Medicaid expansion. So it means hospitals are going to be taking the cuts, but we're not going to get the revenue that would have come with Medicaid expansion. In fairness, our governor, who was not a supporter of this law, came out in favor of Medicaid expansion. You know that Governor Scott made that decision. The state Senate, strongly supported by people like Senator Thrasher, supported Medicaid expansion. But when it hit the House of Representatives, that got nowhere. And to date, the um, state of Florida is deciding not to expand Medicaid. Whether we can reverse that decision this next year is, of course, a huge energy that we're putting forth uh, going into the legislative session that lies ahead. Number three update. Changes to this law are really needed to avoid unintended consequences, but they're not likely to occur. When a law of this complexity is passed, there typically are technical corrections after that law is passed. That was true of Medicare. There were changes to the Medicare law in 1966, 67, and 68. But with this law, even though everybody recognizes their problems, resulting from how rapidly it was passed, it never went through the normal conference process in the, in the Congress. If you remember the circumstances, Senator Kennedy had died, and it got kind of pushed through. And so they never really went and put this through the normal vetting that sometimes occurs, particularly laws of this size. So there's some things that they really made some mistakes, probably unintentionally, that need to be fixed. But I would suggest to you, due to partisan gridlock in Washington, those fixes are not likely to occur. If you look at the two quotes I'm going to show you now, Senator McConnell, the leader of the Republican Party in the Senate, says, I don't think it can be fixed. I think the only solution is to repeal it root and branch. Senator Baucus, a Democrat who helped write the law, says, we're not going to open up this law and make any changes to it. That's like opening Pandora's box. We don't want to take the risk. So you've got the Republicans who just kind of really don't want to have anything to do with it anyway, and you've got the Democrats who don't want to tinker with it. And so what we have is a law that's going in to be implemented that has some problems that need to be fixed. And, and it's probably, we don't have time to go through what I would consider the host of corrections that need to be made, but I'll give you one example, because I have fun doing this one, that really relates to the insurance section of the law. One of the consequences of this law is that it tightens age rating bands and therefore affects insurance underwriting. I'm going to let that sit because if you're like me, you have no idea 
really what that means. Um, it gets technical, but it's really not that complicated. Currently, in 40, over 40 states, the insurance rating bands are in a 5 to 1 ratio or a 7 to 1 ratio. Let's play with 5 to 1, even though in Florida it's 7 to 1. What that means is that the insurance laws allow for you to charge an older adult who uses a lot more health care seven times more than a younger adult. So a 63-year-old is allowed by law in the age rating banding is allowed to be charged seven times more than a 23-year-old. Effective January 1, 2014, as a result of the Affordable Care Act, those those age rating bands get narrowed to a three to one ratio. So that insurance can no longer charge an older adult more than three times a younger adult. There is no one in the insurance business, including Pat Garrity, the CEO of Florida Blue, who does not believe the consequence of that is that younger Americans are going to pay a whole lot more for health insurance coverage because now they're going to be forced to be subsidizing the older Americans whom they used to be able to charge more for. You get that? So it's really not very complicated to understand this. And most legislators who I would submit, with all due respect to the legislators, probably had no understanding whatsoever of that when they passed this law. Most of them say, boy, we need to fix that. But they're not going to do it. And so when you see the pricing coming out, and Camille and I were talking about that just a minute ago, A lot of younger adults are suddenly getting their insurance uh, quotes for next year and finding they're paying much more dramatically than they were previously. And this is people who were buying insurance outside of an employer situation. It it doesn't relate to us, obviously. Uh, So that what we call ban compression is going to have unintended consequences, but it's probably not going to get fixed, at least in the short term. So some of these definitions and regulations within the law uh, are going to go on forward unchanged and no corrections made. Number four is this delay of employer requirement. There are people who've asked me, why did they decide to delay the employer requirements but not the individual mandate? And the reality is that the employer requirements probably have the least impact on coverage expansion because the Kaiser poll says that some 90% of the companies over 50 employees already offer insurance. So to take those requirements off the table probably had the least consequences, and the administration is trying to implement this very complicated law. Business was really reacting to the penalties and taxes that they were going to have to pay, and so they just backed off of that for a year, and that's kind of what happened here. On the other hand, um, you notice that, that one of the things that the Republicans have tried to do in this negotiation that's occurring in Washington right now is to say, let's delay the individual mandate until 2015 too. You probably heard that, and again, I don't see that that happening. So uh, again, uh, I would argue that uh, that's a pretty insignificant change, but one that people want to know. The other uh, update would be that many states have chosen to defer to the federal government to create these health care exchanges, this new health care marketplace. The intent of the law was that each state would create these exchanges within the state. I don't think the administration ever thought that the states wouldn't do that. But if you look at the map, all the states in blue are saying, we're not going to do it. If you want to do it, federal government, you have to swoop in and do it yourself, including the state of Florida. The state of Florida legislature voted not to create health insurance exchanges a couple of years ago and said, if you want it done in Florida, federal government, you come in and do it yourself. Uh, And so uh, for that reason, we have quite an interesting complication as these um, Exchanges are being created, and there's a lot of noise about that right now. Part of the problem is that as these exchanges are being implemented, it involves an incredible computer system across the country. Basically, as people go to the exchanges, they go and this data system connects Homeland Security, the IRS, Health and Human Services, and Social Security Administration. Because what they're trying to validate when you go to apply for insurance on the exchanges, are you a citizen, Homeland Security, are you employed? We go to the IRS. And, and are you eligible for the subsidies that are available through the exchanges? So you can imagine, remember we implemented an electronic medical record <laughs> in one hospital? And can you imagine putting together a computer system across the entire 50 states where people are applying for insurance and this has to grab data from all these major governmental organizations and then respond back to tell that person whether you're eligible. 
And what have y'all read in the last couple of weeks? The system has crashed. I don't think any of us should be surprised. I was listening to Mr. Garrity what, last week from Florida Blue, and, and you know he's quite frustrated. Th there have been tens of thousands of people attempting to apply for insurance through these changes in Florida, and specifically to Florida Blue, but nobody can get through to validate what they're doing because of this computer system. And he stated, people in Washington really say this is the most complex data sharing operation in the history of this country. And they just weren't prepared for the volume and, and to manage this. It just, it just isn't, isn't ready. And, and again, not, not that much of a, of a surprise, I guess, but um, that's what you're reading about. And, and we hope that obviously that's going to get fixed at some point so these people who are applying for insurance will be able to really know whether they're eligible and can get that insurance through the exchanges. The final update point is all of us are preparing for the payment changes that I decided I described. There is a reason that Mr. Mitrick is in charge of transitional care at Baptist because we're working very closely at how we take care of people once they're discharged from hospitals. So Joe's responsible for the new work we're doing with skilled nursing facilities, with Brooks Rehab, with Home Health, to make sure we do a better job of providing continuity of care beyond the acute care episode. Obviously, all of us are paying a lot of attention to quality outcomes, to patient satisfaction outcomes, because again, of the pay for performance component of this. And, and that's large reason much of that is being done. So I'm gonna stop there with an update and, and simply say, uh, in a summary that this law is going to go into effect unchanged without needing revision. There's probably going to be unintended consequences. There are some concerns evidenced by the exchanges about the readiness to in implement this. The president said, by the way, we need to tell you there are probably going to be some glitches, and there have been. Expansion is going to fall short of the 32 million people that we thought would move into insurance because so many states have opted out of uh, Medicaid. And there is, over time, going to be a shift in the way providers, both hospitals and physicians, are paid. How fast that's going to occur, obviously, I don't know. The, the final uh, little section I was going to run through are sort of Hugh Green's list of assumptions about what it means for healthcare delivery in a post-reform era. I'm going to click through this real quickly, but I use the Wayne Gretzky quote intentionally because basically he says if you're going to play ho hockey, it's best not to skate to where the puck is, but where the puck is going. And I would argue that in healthcare reform, we're not quite sure where the puck's going, but even more important, we're not sure how fast it's gonna get there. It really is significant as to how fast all of this moves. If we knew that the thief of service system is gonna be gone in five years, we'd probably be doing different things than we're currently doing. We just don't know how rapidly this is going to move. So I'm just gonna tell you real quickly in rapid fire my assumptions about the future. Number one, that change is inevitable. I think anyone who believes that the status quo is gonna remain as it is, uh, is, is probably incorrect, and that quite frankly, uh, the status quo is, is not sustainable long term. Number two, that consumerism in healthcare is going to grow. As consumers go to exchanges and begin to buy product themselves, they wanna know how much does this cost? Which health systems, which doctors are more expensive? Who has the best outcomes when they do heart casts? And so you're going to see a consumerism in healthcare that's not heretofore existed because someone else is always paying the bill. And I believe that very strongly it, with transparency of price and outcomes, you know, that, that's going to be a change in the healthcare delivery system. What that means is there's going to be greater accountability for performance related to quality, patient safety, cost as people begin to compare these things and you begin to see sort of consumer report kind of comparisons. Sometimes they're not accurate, but I think you're gonna see more of that activity going forward. Uh, number four, I would suggest that there's going to be um, a change gradually away from the fee-for-service system, as I've already alluded. Uh, number five, that uh, you're going to see greater integration of the components of the healthcare system. You already see it occurring. Uh, hospital systems, acquiring physician practices, health plans acquiring physician practices. Florida Blue brought a multi-specialty clinic in Tampa several months ago. You're seeing hospitals buying health plans. Florida Hospital Orlando just announced the creation of their own health plan to complete, compete with the Aetnas and the Florida Blues. And you even see health plans buying health systems. 
So the Blue Cross organization in Pittsburgh just announced they're buying a hospital system in the Pittsburgh area. Why is all this integration occurring? Well, as the payment system changes, people have got to get out of their individual silos and begin to start working in a more integrated way with each other. So you see this integration occurring, and of course the key question is who's going to be the integrator? You know, and, and so you see various people seeking to step into that role. I think the other thing that's going to occur in, a, in an era of reform is a ever-increasing shortage of physicians and other clinical staff. It's almost the perfect storm. You've got physicians and nursing, nurses aging and moving toward retirement, but you're also, through reform, got increased demand on the system as more people get access to the system. And you've got the compounding effect of the demographics and the aging of the population placing a demand. And so in Massachusetts, when 98.5% of the people suddenly have access to the system, there are now six to eight months waits on getting into a primary care doctor. That ought to scare us because in Massachusetts, there are more primary care doctors per population than any of the other 50 states. There was a shortage that resulted because all of a sudden everybody's got access and, and that created this shortage. And so I think we're gonna see a shortage and that's something we ought to be concerned about. And then I think there's a final point and that is that, um, this is the optimistic point, I really still believe that our healthcare systems can remain vibrant. When I became a hospital administrator in 1984, all the old guys were saying, we gotta get out of this, they're implementing DRGs, life's never gonna be the same. We've all done fine. And I really do believe that this fear and panic around healthcare reform is probably overstated. We'll work through this, we'll work through it steadily, and we will continue to try to improve the care we give and I think Baptist in particular will remain a very vital organization even in the era of healthcare reform. So I don't think people ought to be panicking about this and I for one think that we are positioning ourselves very well for this era that lies ahead. So I'm gonna throw out a couple of quick questions. We are pushing the time, but we got started later. Uh, you know, how does the healthcare uh, act affect me? And, and, and here's the question. Uh, does it impact health insurance at Baptist? And, and the only answer to that is no. The purpose of the Affordable Care Act is not to take away employer health insurance. In fact, it's actually trying to expand employer health insurance. So employ, in our case, we're not going to be changing our health care coverage as a function of this law. And there's a lot of people that really believe that. Now, the other question is, will there be any employers who are going to drop health insurance coverage and push people to these exchanges? And the answer to that is, we don't know. You've been reading that some of the large companies like UPS and others are moving their retirees and not providing coverage and moving them to exchanges. You see a couple of companies like Darden Restaurants, they, they run Olive Garden and some of those, that are really beginning to talk about moving their employees into the exchanges, basically saying, we'll pay the penalty and move our employees, we'll just give them money and let them go buy their own insurance on the exchanges. So that is a possibility. It did not happen in the state of Massachusetts. So, um, you know, I, I don't think we're going to see a lot of movement in the employer world, but I really can't predict that. Uh, number two question is, how about, how does this affect Medicare? My own um, mother-in-law and father-in-law who are in their 80s are absolutely convinced that Medicare is going away as a function of the Affordable Care Act. And I just want us to understand, this does not affect Medicare. In fact, by law, in Section 3601, the Affordable Care Act cannot impact the benefits of Medicare by law. So it really does not change currently those people who are eligible for Medicare. So as your elderly parents and grandparents talk about this law that they may not like, oftentimes because they have some feelings about pre the president or Obamacare or whatever, uh, but it really doesn't affect Medicare per se as we know it, and I think that's a misnomer. Number three question. Uh, will I be taxed now for that portion of my health insurance that's paid by the employer, by Baptist? Is there a new payroll tax that's going to be added? And the answer to that, the first one, is no. Uh, health benefits, the part we contribute, are not going to be taxed. It'll still be pre-taxed. Where you may be confused is, on your W-2 that you're going to get this year, it's going to show you the amount that we contribute to your health insurance. By law, we're required to show that but that is informational only and it's not taxed. So don't let that confuse you. Number two, um, there really are no new payroll taxes 
unless you make more than $200,000 as an individual or $250,000 as a family. And if you do, there are new taxes. There's a higher Medicare tax moving from 1.45% to 2.35%. And for the first time ever, for people at that income level, they're going to pay a Medicare tax on unearned income, dividend and interest income. And so you hear people say, I'm going to be paying more taxes. Well, if you're in that income bracket, the answer is you will. But for people below family income of $250,000, you will not pay more taxes. Third question, fourth question, whatever one we're on. <laughs> I have a 24-year-old who's moved back home. Does this help them get insurance? And as we've already pointed out, it does. This law requires all insurance to cover children up to age 26. Probably the part that's least understood about this, they don't have to live with you. They can be married. We still have to cover them. Now, we don't have to cover their spouse. We only cover the child. But you can have a married child who's 25 who lives in Baldwin, and we are required to provide health insurance by law as a function of this law. Kind of an interesting tidbit of the law. Again, thank you for being here. Thank you for your interest in this subject. I got to tell you, in an hour, it's hard to cover a 3,000 page law. But this, uh, this is an attempt to at least give you some insight about the law and hopefully answer some of your questions about it. So, have a great day.